Hello and welcome to Down the Scope. Today we'll be looking at the histology of the small intestine. The small intestine is a site of further digestion but also absorption of nutrients. Both of these processes happen at the cell surface membrane of enterocytes, the epithelial cells of the small intestine. So one of the most important aspects of the small intestine's microscopic structure is maximizing surface area. In terms of anatomy, the small intestine can be divided into three main parts, the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. The duodenum runs from the stomach and forms a loop around the pancreas. Pancreatic duct and bile duct empty into the duodenum. Next follows the jejunum, which is the longest section. There's no clear anatomic landmark between the jejunum and ileum in mammals, but in chickens, there's a small nubbin called Meckel's diverticulum, which divides the jejunum and ileum. Histologically, these regions share many similarities, but there are also some notable differences, particularly in some submucosal structures. We'll come on to those differences later, but first let's study the basic structure at low and high power. At low power, we can see the main distinguishing feature of the small intestine. The mucosa is highly folded, forming finger-like projections into the lumen. These are the villi. Underneath the villi, there is a layer of smooth muscle called the muscularis mucosa. It's not particularly obvious in this section. You can maybe see a few cells of it just running here, but we'll find sections later on where it's much more evident. All the connective tissue below the muscularis mucosa is the submucosa. Here you'll find larger blood vessels, lymphatics, nerves, and ganglia. Next are the two layers of the muscularis externa, an inner circular layer and an outer longitudinal layer. Finally, the outermost layer of the small intestine is the serosa, which is composed of connective tissue and the mesothelial lining. Often at one border of the intestine, you'll find that the serosa is expanded by larger blood vessels, maybe some lymphoid tissue and adipose tissue. This is the mesentery, the connective tissue that suspends the intestine within the abdominal cavity. Let's have a closer look at the smaller structures and cell types in each of these areas, starting with the epithelium. All epithelial cells in the small intestine begin their lives in the crypts of Leverkusen at the base of the villi. Stem cells constantly divide with one daughter cell from each division, moving up the villus and differentiating while the other remains behind. You'll often see mitotic figures in normal crypts as a result of these cell divisions. Stem cells will differentiate into two main cell types, enterocytes and goblet cells. Enterocytes are the most common cell type and are responsible for the final stages of digestion and absorption. They can be identified by the presence of microvilli on their apical cell membrane. You'll often be able to see this as a slightly fuzzy area where the cell meets the lumen. These are the microvilli, collectively called the brush border. Their function is to increase the surface area of the cell membrane so as much digestion and absorption can take place as possible. The other common cell type is the goblet cell. These are mucus-producing cells. You can identify them because much of the cytoplasm is taken up by a slightly clearer, bluish vacuole full of mucus. Sometimes you'll be able to appreciate that below the vacuole, there is a thin stem-like area going down to the nucleus, just like a wine glass or goblet, hence the cell's name. Usually you'll be able to see a few other cell nuclei randomly dotted around in the epithelium. Most of these are intraepithelial leukocytes, which are part of the resident immune system. For example, in this section, we've got a few eosinophils within the epithelium, which you can identify by their lovely granular eosinophilic cytoplasm. And if we head on over here, there's the cell nucleus of a lymphocyte, which is also transiting through the epithelium. Going back down to the crypt, sometimes you can see another cell type, the panith cell. These are quite distinctive as their cytoplasm is filled with eosinophilic granules. These cells secrete antimicrobial peptides and proteins, so form part of the innate immune system in the intestine. In some species like mice, sheep, and cows, you can sometimes see cells with even larger eosinophilic globules in their cytoplasm. These are globule leukocytes and are related to mast cells. 
Their presence is often associated with chronic parasitic infections. Lastly, there are enteroendocrine cells. These are very hard to spot, and I don't think I've ever really been able to convincingly find one. In the textbooks, they'll tell you that they also have eosinophilic granules and that these are located between the nucleus and the basement membrane rather than between the nucleus and the apical membrane, as in the palace cells. In this section of pig intestine, I managed to find a cell in the crypts with eosinophilic granules below the nucleus, but I can also spot them hanging around a little bit higher up. Here's another example. So I'm not entirely sure that these are enteroendocrine cells, but this is what the textbook says that they could look like. Now let's move towards the core of the villus. This connective tissue here is the lamina propria. Each villus has blood vessels which wrap around a central lymphatic vessel called the lacteal. It's quite difficult to appreciate this three-dimensional structure on a slide. Instead, you'll often find lots of small blood vessels, such as these ones here. We can see the red blood cell and the lumen accompanied by a neutrophil and then lined by an endothelial cell. And then in the center of this villus, we have another endothelial lined vessel, but no red blood cell inside it. This is probably the lacteal. And in fact, if we come over to this villus here next to our perfect goblet cell, we have another little capillary with red blood cells lining up nicely in its lumen and in the center of this endothelial lined space without any red blood cells. So this is another example of a lacteal. Other cell nuclei in the lamina propria will be a mixture of fibrocytes, something like this flatter, more spindeloid nucleus, and leukocytes such as eosinophils, maybe that's a neutrophil, and then you'll often find quite a few lymphocytes as well, but these tend to be in the deeper parts of the lamina propria. Underneath the mucosa, we can try and spot the muscularis mucosa again. This is a different section of intestine from a calf. And you can see the crypts here. And then underneath there's some smooth muscle, just a thin layer. This is the muscularis mucosa, much more convincingly than that section of pig intestine that we saw before. Below that, we have a variably thick submucosa. This connective tissue here between the muscularis mucosa and the muscularis externa. We can see some larger blood vessels like this artery and a vein. And then we'll also be able to find nerve fibers, uh, a structure like this. You can tell the collagen looks quite thick and then you get this kind of slightly lighter, finer, wavy material. That's a nerve fiber. And then the last structure in the submucosa will often find ganglia, which are composed of neurons. The neurons have a slightly more basophilic granular cytoplasm and are quite irregular in shape. So after scooting around for a little bit, I managed to find a nice example of a ganglia. These are the neurons. They have quite basophilic granular cytoplasm and uh, more irregularly shaped. They have really large nuclei compared to the other cells in the submucosa, often with very prominent nucleoli. Finally, there are the external muscular layers. These were covered quite thoroughly in the stomach histology video. So if you need some help with those, you can go and have a watch of that. One thing that we didn't mention is that also within this connective tissue between the two muscle layers, you'll often find ganglia and aggregates of neurons. These are the neurons that are responsible for controlling peristalsis and are known as the myenteric plexus. Before we finish, it's worth discussing some of the special structures that can help define if a section was taken from the duodenum, jejunum, or ileum. In sections of duodenum, the submucosa is often expanded by large numbers of glands. These are Brunner's glands, which secrete large amounts of mucus into the lumen, which is there to protect the duodenum from the acidic stomach contents that pass through it. Sections of ileum tend to have lymphoid aggregates in the submucosa. 
These are called pears patches and form part of the adaptive immune system. Typically, you'll see a big submucosa expanded by lots of lymphoid follicles, which might have germinal centers if they're active. So if you can see neither a Brunner's gland nor pears patches, then you've probably got a section of jejunum. The proportion of goblet cells might vary between intestinal sections as well, with the ileum tending to have more goblet cells. However, I find this is not a particularly reliable indicator when you've got huge submucosal structures to help you. So that's everything I can think of in terms of small intestinal histology, but you might have thought of something else. If you have any questions or topics you'd like me to cover in future videos, please feel free to leave a comment. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more content on histology of mammals and other animals. Thanks for watching and until next time, goodbye.